Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to have everybody in with us again this afternoon, and uh, we've got a lot of folk from out of state, and I haven't uh, got the prerogative to introduce all of them, but for those of you who it applies to, we're glad you're here. We've got Indiana and Ohio and Florida, and uh, I think that's most of them. But anyway, we're glad you're all here. For those of you joining us on television, we always like to make it plain and understood that we're just a Bible study, verse by verse, and uh, we uh, do not adhere to any particular group's doctrines. We're just going to search the scriptures and uh, hopefully bring out the truth. We pray constantly that the Lord will keep us from any error and uh, we want nothing but the truth of God's word going out over the airwaves. And so we, we cover your prayers. We thank you out in television for your letters and your financial help. And uh, we just trust that we can do it all for the Lord's glory and none of ours. Now again, we're going to go right into the book because because this is what our letters say. Don't waste any time with announcements. So we'll go right into Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, for those of you who have been with us this far in Hebrews, by the way, Iris wants me to point out, we are now in the middle four programs of our book and tape number 48 already. So uh, if you have a question about this particular program and you call or write, just mention this number right here, 482. And this is the first program. As we go through the afternoon, we'll get up to 1, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, so just remember that formula if you uh, write concerning the program. All right, so now then in Hebrews chapter 4, we are still emphasizing the fact that Hebrews was written primarily, not exclusively, what was written primarily for Jews who were on the fence. And uh, they still had one foot in Judaism with all of its legalism and the Mosaic law. But over here, they were contemplating Paul's gospel of grace. And so the whole idea of the letter is is to prove to these people beyond a shadow of doubt who Jesus of Nazareth, as they understood him, who he really was. He was God the Son. He was the Creator. He was the Sustainer. And he was also then, of course, the Redeemer, not just of Israel, but of all mankind, and now consequently Paul uses the verse that he tasted death for every man, not just Israel, but for the whole world. And so as we come through these first three chapters, this has been the emphasis of who God the Son really is, and what he has done, and how even we as non-Jews must understand. Now the last program we were in, in chapter 3, the apostle is using the horrible dilemma of Israel's refusing to go into the land of promise at Kadesh Barnea in particular, when as you all know the account in unbelief, in unbelief, what God said they could do, Israel says, no, we can't. And I guess if there was any one act of disobedience in all of Israel's history that perturbed God the most, that was it. They could have fallen as they did at Mount Sinai into idol worship around that golden calf. They went into various other times of rank disobedience, but nothing pops up over and over in Scripture as an example of abject disobedience brought about by unbelief as Kadesh Barnea. And again, I, I just have to remind folks, especially out there in television, where we have so many people that have just never, never read or studied the Bible before. So remember, I always have to keep those folks in mind when I repeat and repeat and repeat. You want to remember that as Israel was there at the gate of the Promised Land, Kadesh Barnea, God had told them distinctly, explicitly, that he would drive the enemy out, he would use hornets, he would use whatever he would have to use, and all 
Israel had to do was walk in and occupy it without raising a sweat, without losing a drop of blood, just go in and take it. But you see, Israel's first step of unbelief was says, when they said, well, at least let us go in and spy out the land. Let us see if we can do it. And you know, God in His goodness, and I think those of us who are believers, the older we get, the more we realize the goodness and the grace of God. And so God in His grace and in His goodness says, well, all right. Pick out 12 men. Now, most people think that God told them to do that. No, he did not. If you go back and re recap the whole chain of events, God didn't say send in 12 spies. God says go in and take it. But Israel, in their first step of unbelief, said, well, can't we send in spies? And then God said, yes, go ahead, point one from each tribe, and let them go in and spy out the land. And then you know what happened. Those 12 men came out with a majority report of 10 to 2. The 10 said, can't do it. The 2 said, yes, we can. So who did the nation listen to? The majority. And what have I said for the last 10 years? In spiritual things, in the things concerning this book, the majority is usually, I didn't say always, the majority is usually wrong. Don't go by the majority. Because Jesus pointed out the majority all too plainly himself when he said, Wide is the way, and broad is the gate, and many there be that go therein. But narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Now you see, the two then represented the narrow. They said, yes, we can. But Israel listening to the majority of the ten in abject unbelief. That's all it was. Total unbelief. Said we can't do it. And of course God then responded in his wrath and sent them out into the wilderness then for the next 38 years. And so this is constantly brought up in scripture as an example not only to Israel but to every one of us that there is nothing God detests like unbelief. He can, he can forgive a lot of things. And he can, you might say in his grace, put up with a lot of the, the wickedness and the unbelief in other areas. But when it comes to abject unbelief of something that is so easily understood as our gospel is, by the way, then the wrath of God is kindled. And so when you stop and realize that the vast majority of the human race are headed for the lake of fire, don't blame God. A lot of people do. They say, how can a holy God send people to a place like that? Listen, God didn't send them. They chose to go. And how did they choose to go? By refusing to believe something so simple as the gospel. And so this has been the whole emphasis now, especially in chapter 3, and even as we come into chapter 4, don't forget what Israel did at Kadesh Barnea. All right? Verse 1. So it starts right out with one of Paul's favorite words, therefore. Because of what we've already covered in these first three chapters, therefore, let us fear. Now that's not the kind of a fear that just simply sends you out of your common sense. That is a fear that makes you stop and take notice. This is a fear that makes you stop and really listen to what God is trying to say. And so he said, therefore, let us fear, lest a promise... Now, you know, I can almost stop with every word in Hebrews, can't I? I have been lately. What's a promise? Well, a promise is something that God has backed with His omnipotence, with His sovereignty, and yes, with His grace. And when God makes a promise, you and I can sit on it. We can trust it. Because God will not lie. 
God will not play games. And so here again we have the evidence that God has given promises, 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 not only to Israel, but to the whole human race, all right? So he said, let us take up and be serious and take note, lest a promise, one of the promises of God, being left of us of entering into his rest, that any of you should seem to come short of it. Now I imagine the casual reader would never see this. What do you suppose he's driving at? You know, so many of us, and I know I used to be that way in, in my denominational background, you know, we, we had a criteria that we thought people had to go through to be genuinely saved. And unless they went through our circumscribed criteria, we, we had doubts. And I'm sure that almost every group looks at some of these things this way. They've got their own idea of what God expects a person to do before God can save him. And listen. God isn't going to set up a whole bunch of restrictive rules and regulations for a sinner to go through before he'll save him. God will save a person with, I suppose, so little going for him that most of us would say, hey, he could never be saved. And that's exactly what Paul was saying. Now look at it again. Lest a promise being left us. Now if something has been left to you, what does that mean? It's still yours. It hasn't yet slipped away from you. It's still there for you to cash in on. And so this is what he's appealing. Let lest some of these people have been wavering, and yes, they're considering what Paul has got to offer, but they're still being drawn by all of the ramifications of legalism and Judaism. Paul says, God hasn't given up on you. God hasn't yet crossed you off. You know, I'm sure many of you have heard sermons, I know I have, more than once, where a preacher will get up and he will just make a horrible example of someone who just stood out on the public square and shook his fist in God's face and cursed God, and then they like to make a great big sensational event of it, how that 30 minutes later he was violently killed. Well, that may make good preaching, but it's not Scripture. God never gives up on even a man who will shake his fist and curse God. You know what? Because even where sin abounds, and that would be sinful, no doubt about it, but where that sin abounds, what's even greater? God's grace. And so don't you ever believe that kind of stuff that God gives up on a sinner. No, God never gives up until this soul departs. And so this is again what Paul is saying. Don't you forget that God has not given up on you. There is still a part and parcel of his promises that are enough for you to latch on to and still escape that wrath to come. All right, now let's move on. So let us fear, lest a promise being left that's still there to be taken a hold of, that any of you, even the worst of them, should come what? Short of it. Now, what's the danger? What's the danger, as uh, we'll see a little later on in the chapter, but what is the danger when someone tarries and lingers and fails to latch on to the promise of salvation? Well, let me give you a good example. Come back with me to Acts 24, and you're all going to recognize it as soon as we get there. Acts 24. And we'll start at verse 24. Acts 24. And Paul, of course, is dealing with Felix. Acts 24. Got it? Verse 24. After certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now look at verse 25. He reasoned, Felix did, this rank unbeliever. And as he reasoned of righteousness, in other words, God's saving grace, temperance, 
and the judgment to come. What does that tell you? Paul laid out the whole picture. Paul didn't refrain from telling him what his doom was going to be if he did not come into salvation. And so he reasoned of all these things that Paul had covered, the judgment to come, and he trembled. That's how much he considered it. And he answered, what? Paul, I'm ready to believe. No. He answered, go thy way for this time. What does that tell you? Felix hadn't crossed it off. He hadn't just adamantly told Paul, take off. I'll never listen to you again. But he was postponing it, see? Postponing it. Just exactly what Paul is warning these Jews in Hebrews. Don't postpone it for today. See, that's the word throughout these chapters. Today, harden not your hearts as they did, as Felix did. And you see, every time that Felix would listen to Paul, what happened to his heart's condition? Softer or harder? Well, harder. And now, just read on and we'll see what evidently happened to this man. So he says, go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season. In other words, when I'm more in line to step out of my wicked lifestyle and become a believer. When a more convenient season comes along, I'll call for you. And then verse 26, on top of that, his wicked mind was looking for a bribe. For he hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener. See? So it wasn't just once, not even twice. Several times this Roman authority reasoned of righteousness and judgment to come. And every time, no doubt, his heart became harder. And he says, well, Paul, if you're not ready to pay for your way out of here, then be gone. But now the reason I know that Felix never came to a place of salvation, he put it off and put it off, is because, verse 27, what's the first word? But, but, he never responded. He never responded. But, after the two years that Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. What happened to the man? Just exactly what Hebrews is warning against. Felix had every opportunity to yet become a believer. But what does he say? Not now. Maybe later. Not now. Now come back to Hebrews and see how apropos this is. Oh, be careful lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest, that is salvation, that any of you, even a Felix, should seem to come short of it. And he did, you see, as far as we know, he came short. He never did step in to that which he saw was the right way. And I think we see this throughout all of human history, how that mankind is either absolutely destitute of spiritual insight or they play around like a cat with a mouse until finally what happens invariably? That little mouse slips away. It's fresh on my mind. My old cat just did it again the other day. Had a mouse and played with it and played with it, and I almost was getting frantic. I had killed the poor thing. But what do they do? They fool around and they fool around, and all of a sudden it gets away. Well, see, that's what happens to so many people with God's plan of salvation. They play around with it. They consider it. They talk about it. But they will never give in and accept God's saving grace. And consequently, they come short of it. Well, that's not God's fault. God has done all He can do. And you want to remember, God never forces His salvation on anybody. It's a matter of the free will, as God, of course, inspires us with the Spirit. All right, now I guess we got time. I hated to go into verse 2 unless I had a little more time, but I think maybe we can cover it. Verse 2, 4, or a continuing of the thought. 
For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Now don't lose sight of your pronouns here. Who are the them? Israel at Kadesh Barnea. See, that's our whole idea of the, of the lesson. Don't forget Israel at Kadesh Barnea. When they had all the promises of God to go in and take Canaan without a drop of sweat or losing a drop of blood and because of unbelief turned away. All right, so Paul is using it again. For unto us today in this age of grace under Paul's apostleship, the gospel is preached. Well, that's easy enough to understand. We all know that Paul's gospel, that Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead, that that's the means of salvation. But our gospel was preached as well as unto them. Now, we have to be careful here. What does the word gospel always mean? Good news. Good news. Good news. Now, how far back in human history does good news go? All the way back to Genesis chapter 3. But how far back does Paul's gospel go? Back to Paul's ministry. Naturally, it's his gospel. All right, so now, if you look at this word gospel as good news, then all of the, the garbage just falls away, and you've got nothing left but bare truth. And so, when the good news was presented in Genesis 3.15, what was it? Let's go back and look. All the way back to Genesis 3.15, we have good news. Now, it's not the gospel of the grace of God. It's not that Christ died and rose from the dead, but it's good news. My, it's good news. Genesis chapter 3, most of you should know what this verse says. And the Lord is dealing with Satan right after the fall. Immediately after the fall. And what's the good news? That God is going to defeat Satan. You know that? That's good news. All right, look at it. Where the Lord says to Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Who's in control here? God is. And I will put between enmity between thy seed and her seed. Well, who's her seed? The seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. And it, the seed of the woman, Jesus the Christ, shall bruise thy head. Now, how do you kill a serpent? On the head. On the head. And so what's the implication here? That one day the seed of the woman, Jesus the Christ, would defeat and put out a commission, Satan. And what is that? That's good news. It's the only thing the human race had left. Adam and Eve had now eaten. The race has fallen. And Satan is seemingly glorying in his victory. But God comes back and says, No, I've got good news. I'm going to provide a way back into fellowship with the Creator. And so here we have the first instance of good news. Now let's go up a little further to Genesis chapter 12. Now I'm skipping a bunch of them in between here. But here up in Genesis chapter 12. Oh, some more good news. Now we don't ordinarily think of it as gospel, but it was. My, I don't know what else it could have been so far as Abram was concerned. It was gospel. It was good news. And what was it? Let's look at it. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said, back in chapter 11, He had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And now here we come. Promises. And I just got through telling at the opening of the program, what are promises? Hey, they're good news. They're gospel. And what are they? I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. Make your name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee. Curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, because through Abram would come the Christ, all families of the earth be blessed. Now, if that wasn't good news, I don't know what else could have been. 
Now, in order to put the frosting on the cake, let's jump all the way up to Romans chapter 4 and see what believing this good news did for the man Abraham. Romans chapter 4. <coughs> verse 3. Romans chapter 4, we'll just drop down to verse 3. Now remember what I've got you thinking. What has been the good news? Oh, God's means of bringing salvation to various segments of the human race. They didn't all believe that Christ would die and be resurrected from the dead. They couldn't. It hadn't happened yet. The Roman cross wasn't even invented until the Roman Empire. But these people had the good news of God's promises. And God's promise to Abraham was, Leave Ur, and I will make of you, I will do this, and I will do that. Now, when Abram responded to that word of God, by his faith, look what God did. Verse, what did I say, three? three. For what saith the Scripture? Not what Moses said, not what Abraham said, not what anybody else said. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God says, Abraham believed God. You see that? Abraham did not do like Israel did at Kadesh and say, No, God, I don't think you can do this. I'm a hundred years old. Sarah is ninety. I can't do this. But see, Abraham believed God, as impossible as it may have seemed. And what did God do? Saved him. That's all. Saved him out of paganism, out of idolatry. How do I know? Because it says Abraham believed God and it, his believing, his faith, his faith was counted unto him for what? Righteousness. Now that didn't make Abraham sprout wings. Abraham didn't suddenly become a sinless individual. Abraham failed miserably after all this. Did he lose his salvation? Heavens no. He merely showed how human he really was. But in spite of all of his failures, God reckoned him what? Righteous. And why was he righteous? Because he believed God. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.